Welcome to the Startup Grind. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Startup Grind Buffalo. I'm excited you're all here. We're getting some of all these people. Hey Jess. Hey, what's up? Hey! Alright, thank you. That was efficient. Thank you, my friend from Toronto. Um, if you haven't met any of them. We have a, a pretty large group of people from Toronto. If you're from Toronto, give a quick, uh, quick shout. Yeah. So we want to thank Startup Grind, uh, Toronto, Michael oh, Kaylee, Matt Davison, Forward Through North for sponsoring that trip uh, down here. And the purpose of the trip, we wanted to bring people from Toronto, show what's going on in Buffalo, we'll talk about 40 Through North, we'll talk about CAD, we'll talk about Dig, we'll talk about all the opportunities, all the resources, and, you know, learn. We've had uh, some Canadian speakers, so I think it's really, really cool, and we gotta get up to Toronto, guys. I don't know, we gotta organize a startup around Buffalo Bus to Toronto. Maybe we'll put that in the works. <laughs> First beer's on you. Um, real, real quick, we have an awesome event, so I wanna get to it. Uh, it's nice out, so I won't keep any longer. My buddy Chris Way, the Antigua Project, you might have seen his Kickstarter. Uh, he's in the back there. He has a really cool startup taking uh, tires for Rwanda, making them into sandals. Um, so this is what they look like. Really awesome double uh, bottom line, social benefits. Uh, they're having a party on Friday, but he told me it's sold out. So if you got a ticket, that's awesome. I don't have a ticket, so I'm kind of uh, bummed I miss out. But they're going to be retailing at the West Side Bazaar. Uh, check them out. Um, we are taking a short break over the summer. So I just wanted to uh, you know, make sure there's no misconceptions. We're not going anywhere. If you need anything over the summer, please reach out. Uh, but please go out and enjoy Buffalo Summer because Buffalo Summer is freaking awesome and we deserve it after the winter we had. So we, we got some big things in the works uh, when we pick back up. Um, and thank you all for your support. You know, it's been a year. This is a year. So it's pretty interesting to look back. We've had some great speakers, tons of uh, content, awesome people coming in, tons of connections. Um, I think it's been good. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> you guys keep coming. So. Um, that's it. With that, we're going to get started. Anthony Johnson is our speaker tonight. Anthony has... Oh, dude, I can't... i got to do the sponsors. Sorry, Anthony. No problem. Money comes first. I would be really upset with myself if I forgot the sponsors, because they are so generous with their time and donations. Jessica Edwards, Dave. That's, I looked at her, and she was like... You want to do a shot? Dig is an awesome co-working space, Come, first day is free, check it out, tons of resources, tons of mentors, it's a place to be. Neil Carroll, Nickel City Graphics, does a great job with the photos, the videos, uh, if you need any video content, check them out. Yeah. Launch New York, again, sponsoring us, Launch New York has resources for entrepreneurs and high growth uh, companies, whether it's capital, uh, mentors, team members, um, launchnewyork.org for accessing those resources. Um, ALS Consulting, ALSLeadership.com, Paul Grenier, uh, helped us out with the beer. Uh, David Culligan, I'm sure you're still here, Culligan Law, uh, again with the beer. Um, thank you guys, Culligan Law, great law firm, startups, um, business, all kinds of aspects. And David is a huge supporter of Buffalo, Buffalo Angels. Um, I think that's the first sponsors. <laughs> Oh, Shirt Outfitters with awesome t-shirts. Shirt Outfitters, shirtoutfitters.com. Literally putting the shirt on our backs. Uh, any kind of t-shirt, apparel, anything printed, check them out, Shirt Outfitters. And with that, we're gonna get started. Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson has vast experience in business development, management, biosciences, and startups. He's a native of Washington, D.C. He earned a uh, Bachelor's of Science degree from Fisk University in Biology. He holds an MBA in International Strategy from Manchester Business School in Manchester, England. In addition, he has completed postgraduate research in neuroscience. So with that, let's make some noise. Let's get Anthony on stage. <laughs> so Anthony, I got you uh, the water, but he, he brought his beer to the stage, so. <laughs> That's good, we're gonna be over. Let's start right here, there it is. One of those events. Um, so I guess we'll start pretty broad. You know, talk about Empire Genomics. What does Empire Genomics do, and what do you uh, do as part of that? All right. Uh, 
Testing, testing. Okay, perfect. So um, first, thanks everyone for having me out for the event tonight. This is pretty phenomenal to see kind of the, the crowd we have here and what's taking place in Buffalo. And Empire Jones, we started actually back in 2006. And it was started by a lady by the name of Dr. Norman Nowak, who is born and raised in Buffalo and has been pretty influential in the um, university and the startup community around here. And um, so dating back to 2006, this building over here, which is just to our left called the Center of Excellence in, in um, Life Science and Bioinformatics, we were actually the first tenant there. So we started off and we, we um, similar kind of, I guess, space like this, not as snazzy, but we started off in the facilities used to room where we actually rented space from the University of Buffalo. And um, what we do at Empire Genomics is we are a company that is trying to revolutionize what's taking place in um, the, the practice of how do we manage the disease called cancer. And we do so by using testing. And we, we actually use people's DNA as a way to answer one of three questions. We try to answer the question of what disease does that person have, right? Because historically, you have prostate cancer or you have breast cancer, but we know now that that disease is, is actually very specific. You may have a certain gene that is mutated. And based on that gene, we should be able to tell too what disease you have, how you progress on that, and then more importantly, how do we treat it? And um, the interesting part about it is that the actual materials we use to do this testing came from Buffalo dating back to the probably early 1990s when there was a project called the Human Genome Project. So um, that's kind of what we do, and it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Um, as I acknowledge, we have, we actually just launched to um, the Empire Genomics Imperial Fellows. We have a fellowship program now. We're trying to get back to the community and train people. And I think we have two fellows in the audience. If you guys can stand up and don't be bashful. Come on, don't be bashful. There you go. <laughs> this wasn't a requirement of the fellowship they showed for the beer. <laughs> So, so what do I do for Empire, right? So at Empire, what I do is I'm the CEO and president, and um, I do a bit of everything, right? So in, a, in an early stage environment, in a startup-based environment, I mean, I'm responsible for everything from just staffing to the strategy to being, I think, a chief motivator. But most importantly, what I'm responsible for, I think, are the, um, the people that we have that work for us, right? We have a pretty phenomenal team, and um, without that, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. So when I hear cancer and mapping DNA, it kind of like blows my mind. Like that's such a huge problem that's happened, but such huge potential. And I'm sure cancer has touched a lot of people's lives, and myself included. So, like, how did you, how do you like even, how do you begin? I guess is, is, the, is the problem trying to tackle so big? Like, how do you take the first step? Yeah. So I mean, that that kind of gets down to the strategy of what we do and what makes us different. I think that we like to look at cancer as um, and, and what we do as something that's not futuristic. So when I can look at myself and say I'm a success, it's when you and everyone in this audience can say, so let's take a step back. Think of things like, for instance, um, the PSA test for prostate cancer. Everyone knows about it, right? We may not get it done, but we all, as males, know that the PSA test is a test for cancer or for prostate cancer. We also know that we should get a mammogram right for breast cancer. So the same thing is true from genetics. If we, if we flash forward now three to five years, I think everyone in this audience will be able to say, I'm gonna get my genes mapped to see exactly what I have and, or what I could have, and therefore how should I be treated? That's when I think, I mean, right now, the testing that we do is actually standard of the care in many major metropolitan areas. So if you're in, right now, Texas at MD Anderson, the testing that we offer is being offered to the patients that are there. And for us to make a success, we need to have this, what I call the kind of democratization of cancer therapy and treatment, whereby it's actually given out there to all the populations who would come down with cancer. You mentioned uh, the fellow program, which I think is awesome. Why do you think it's important to uh, give back and how can startups uh, give back, whether it's fellowships or other ways? So I think it's twofold, right? I mean, we give back for two reasons. One is it's a bit selfish. We find it hard to recruit good people. And right now we have around 25 or so employees, and of those employees, I would say probably 40% come from outside of the West New York area. We've had to relocate them here, get them acclimated to the Buffalo winter, and um, now hopefully the Buffalo summer. But um, we need to have, find great talent. And the secondary aspect is, is what we find is that Buffalo has a very 
obviously great work ethic. We have some great institutions on the academic level. So entry level employees, we can find those, but finding ones that have actually experience. And I think one of the issues we have in terms of, and this is across the board, education wise, is that we train people that are good workers, but we're not looking for workers. We're looking for people that actually can come into the business and think about the business from the context of what does my singular role within this business mean for the overall what we're doing? So the fellows, what they're doing is we have two gentlemen here. One of them is, um, has a background in computer science. Another one, I believe, in business with some computer science experience. And what they're doing right now is actually learning and developing for us a new actual laboratory information management system. So what that means is you're taking programming and learning about the biology and the workflow, what we do from an operations perspective, and bringing that together from a, the, the, the entire aspect of when we process a sample from start to finish and give those results, what does it mean? Right, so I think that that's the reason why we actually created this fellowship because we, we're looking for people that can be thinkers, that can actually understand that in order to be a success in business, you have to have an understanding of the entire business and where you fit within that. You may have a singular role, but it's bigger than just that operations, programming, marketing, sales, et cetera, actually. So that's the reason why we've done it. And I think also um, the, the other aspect is just that there's so many people around that we meet on a routine basis that are either looking to change their professions but they've worked in engineering or things like that and they know that healthcare is where we're investing as a community they want to be a part of that and we want to find ways to actually help facilitate that kind of transition whatever way we can so you're a native of washington dc I'm, I'm curious you know what's your story how did you come to buffalo so i came to buffalo um and don't laugh i'm a bit geographically challenged i was living in new york city i was actually working for um, a consulting firm and I got a call from a recruiter. And the recruiter said, I have this great opportunity for you. It's located in Grand Island, New York. And I had told the recruiter that anywhere within a 45 minute commute of the city, I would take it. So I figured Long Island, I have one LIR, and I'm there. <laughs> so this dates back now, this goes back probably to 2003 ish, I believe it was, 2003, 2004. And um, I remember this vividly because it was right around the week before Christmas. So he called me and I knew the company because I had worked in research and I used the product. So the company is called Life Technologies. At the time it was called In Vitro Corporation. So I knew the company, I knew people that worked in, I used the products, and I was a great fit for the role. So I get home and um, I get on the map and look up Grand Island, and I'm thinking Google Maps is a problem, right? Just <laughs> pointing way up here in New York State, and I'm like, Cleveland? It can't be Cleveland. At any rate, long story short, is um, I actually. Um, Told them I would take a phone screen because they said you're, you're a great fit for the role. And the company was headquartered in San Diego, California. So the role, my role was to come in, and um, it was the first role within the company that was in, in charge of bringing together all the disparate technologies they had into a solutions based sale as opposed to selling media, antibodies, and other research tools, which are very commoditized. So, long story short, is um, I come up for a face-to-face -face interview. And it's January the 6th. I had um, been working in the city and I took the last flight out. I get to um, the airport and there's whiteout conditions. So I have to drive down to 190 and I'm thinking, this is not going to work. I'm not coming out here at all. But long story short, I interviewed actually with um, three very great guys basically. And um, I took the role. I was based in um, San Diego, California for basically three, four years I was there. I have a place down here in downtown Buffalo as well, so I never got a real good chance to understand kind of what takes place in Buffalo because I was always on the road and outside of the area. Um, but that's how I moved here. And that's... <laughs> Next time I go to Grand Island, I'm just gonna <clears throat> burst out laughing. But, yeah. <laughs> um, we're glad we're glad you're here. Um, you, you talked about sales. What advice could you give an early stage startup company? In terms of sales, how do you get your first customer? How do you sell something? Wow, it's like the holy grail there. I mean, but I guess the important part is first and foremost, I mean, what has made Empire, I think, a success to date is we focus on exactly that. Most startups think about um, you become enamored with the technology, you become enamored with the process, but very few take the time and effort to actually understand that customer process and how do you actually convert customers over into buying your product or your service. And so we focus on that from day one. 
and we did it out of both necessity, but also I think because it helps to really understand what those product dynamics are. So I want you guys to think back, and maybe everyone, there's a lot of young people in the audience, but 2007, 2008, we had an economic meltdown, basically, right? So we were in the process of launching a new company with a new technology. To your point, it was kind of like Star trek basically, right? So a lot of our customers were big pharma, biotech, academic groups, and then also um, clinical hospitals. And during the economic downturn, people start retrenching and they're not looking at innovating. It's kind of intuitive, but that's what they do. So um, we were out there looking to raise capital and Jack McGowan's in the audience here, basically, right? I'm sure you guys know him. He's a great resource if you don't in terms of both guidance, insight, and access to capital. And one of the things that frequently came up was, do you have any customers? What are your customers? Are they paying for your product or your service? And um, we said, you know what? We're going to show people that people will indeed buy this product and service. And so long story short, to answer your question is, you should definitely focus on getting early customers. It can be families. It can be friends. It'll be discounted by every single investor out there, right? And they'll tell you, when you have 10, you need 20. When you have 20, you need 200. And it keeps going on and on and on. But it, it does two things for you. It, one, helps you to really understand what the requirements are for your product and your service because people vote with their pockets, right? And if you have someone that's going to pay for it, you know that other people pay for it as well. The secondary thing it does is it gives you a great sense of self-esteem when you can say, I've created this, and now I know people are out there buying it, it motivates your team more than you can ever imagine, basically. And I can recall back in the days when we started back in 07, and we had our first order, it was $250, one product, right, one product. Now we get products that are, we're selling things like $320,000, right? Uh-oh. We're good. Here you go. <laughs> So it just does a lot for us. So I think, and long story short is, you should definitely, as soon as possible, find that first customer, whoever that may be. So you mentioned Jack McGowan raising money, uh, NoFad, uh, Dan Pender, the Grand Capital, that you've also raised funds from. Yeah. What advice can you give a startup looking to raise money, uh, to, to talking to investors, and uh, <laughs> Jack's chuckling, so I don't know. Yeah, exactly. so we're so, yeah, how do you get the money? How do you get the money? <laughs> Jeez. I'm asking you all the really easy questions. How do you sell things? How do you get money? <laughs> I mean, what do you do with all the money you've made when you sold the business? Um, it's a short answer. It, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, but I think the important part is two things in terms of raising capital is be confident in yourself and be true to your strategy. Investors, um, be they strategic or financial investors, they have their own motivation and what they're looking for. They're biased. They have a lot of experience and they have the cash, but it's very easy, and I can tell you, if you talk to 10 different investors, you're gonna probably get 15 different ideas of what your business should do, right, and how you should go about doing it, right? And it's because of they're biased by their experience. So get used to, to hearing no. The secondary thing is get to a no. You'll get a lot of investors and they'll, they'll, they'll keep leading you on, keep telling you, I'm saying you're on a good path, bring you back A, B, C, D, E, F, right? And you never get to the point of saying no. It's actually better when you get an investor to tell you no because then you can come back and say, well, now you told me no, I've answered that question, let me ask you again for more capital. As opposed to, this is great, come back and let's talk in a month. So I think in short is, is just be persistent, right? Be persistent and don't be afraid and, and be very, convicted in terms of what you're doing and that you're confident in your strategy and if you are you'll find investors that also may agree with you and will give you capital. That's a good answer. Um, you've also gotten grants for Empire Genomics. You could talk about what advice you could have for, for grants and how you know, startups can work that into business, their business model. Yeah, I think, I mean, grants are the typical non-dilutive funding that's out there. We haven't received a lot of grants. I mean, the ones we have, we received one um, small business innovative research grant, and that was for our, our um, multiple myeloma disease mark we have for a new diagnostic. That comes from the federal government. That was in the order of, I believe, $150,000. Um, grants are laborious. They take a lot of time and effort. They're competitive. And... Um, it depends on kind of the stage of your technology and what you have, right? Sometimes grants aren't a viable option. 
if they are, I definitely encourage you to look at them. But I can tell you too that um, we found it a lot easier. I shouldn't say easy. <laughs> we found it a bit more beneficial to raise capital from private individuals or from people that had an interest in making money as opposed to grants, only because the time, effort, everything you go through is probably um, very similar in nature, but you get much more from the actual financial investment you do from the grants. But grants give you um, great validation. We've had um, great support from New York State and from um, the um, New York State Center of Excellence and, and University of Buffalo. So we received what's called the CAT grant. So that's the, um, I forget what it stands for, but what's the, no? <laughs> Advanced Technology, Center for Advanced Technology. There you go, I'm Jerry, she's <laughs> good guy here too, entrepreneur. So um, the CAT grant is great because it helps you to actually, this is, these are funds that come from the state and they're administered through the University of Buffalo. And the whole aspect is, they're matching grants that help you to accelerate product development. And so we've used that to launch several new services to increase our portfolio of offerings to customers. And those are in the order of probably a couple hundred thousand dollars. And the, the, the match ratio is anywhere from one to one or sometimes four to one. So it's actually worked out very well for us. So grants, um, I'm probably not the biggest expert on those because I really don't do a lot of those for our company. But um, I know if you have something that is both very innovative and you have the time and effort to do it, grants can be a good opportunity. What are some resources that have helped you um, as an entrepreneur, whether it's organizations or uh, tools that you use to keep you going on the entrepreneurial uh, startup business path? Well, I can tell you, it's a lot more you guys have right now than we had when we first got started. When we first came, this building was totally vacant, mothballed. The only thing we had was Alrix right down the road here, basically, right? So, that was pretty much our only go-to source for, for um, drinks and everything else in the area. But um, things are changing dramatically. I mean, in the time we, since we started this business, we had access to um, some funds, like I said, through the University of Buffalo and the CAC grant. We had um, a great person who actually put me in contact with Empire Genomics and who facilitated this both introduction and, and the start of the business with Norman Nowak, a lady by the name of Dr. Marnie Levine from Launch New York now, basically. So, if anyone doesn't know, and I'm sure everyone in this audience does, she's a great resource and can put you in contact with pretty much anyone in the community that um, is doing something of, of worth that you could actually take advantage of. Um, we had funding from Rain Capital. We we had, um, wow, what are some other resources we've used in this? Jeez. I mean, that's a good list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, there's a lot. I think, I think definitely take advantage of the local um, legal community, the local accounting community that helps you both in terms of raising capital, in terms of networking, and they actually have um, individuals that potentially could invest in your company or could help you out in terms of garnering customers. And um, those are the resources we've taken advantage of. So you recently, or Empire Genomics recently, uh, acquired um, Ontario startup, I'm blanking on the name, but... ID Labs. ID Labs, all you Canadian folks. Um, Maybe we, what advice can you give for, for both sides? Like acquiring the company and then, you know, how do you approach somebody or you know, just walk us through, through that process? So, so I think a couple things. I mean, as we think of startups, we always think of organic, right? You start from scratch, acquiring that first customer. And I think it's, it's a, um, a disadvantage from a lot of different perspectives. First and foremost, if someone else already has it and you can buy that at a cheaper price than it costs you to develop it yourself, I encourage you to look at that. And, and, and many people at startups don't think of that. They don't think of themselves as being able to acquire a company. But the process went as far as the following way. We actually um, have a lot of advisors we use in our community, both locally and internationally. And um, we let it be known what we were looking for in terms of growing our business, right? And for us, it's, it's crucial to reach what's called that critical mass. And that critical mass is both in terms of employees, in terms of sales, in terms of product portfolios. And so we actually put out um, a profile of what we were looking for, right? And, and put kind of the marketplace as it were on notice that we were looking to acquire businesses basically. And through one of our, um, it's an interesting story, is a guy who, um, his name is Don Carty. He's based actually in Wales, England. His claim to fame is he lives right next door to where um, Prince William trained when he was in the Air Force over there, actually, right? So that's his claim to fame, at least with me. 
And um, he came to Buffalo because about six or seven years ago, he was starting a new technology. And this is before it launched New York and started New York, but he was looking to move it here because of the manufacturing expertise and expertise that was, that was resident at the university at Buffalo. And we struck up a great relationship basically and continued that friendship and that collegial sort of relationship. And um, in the course of doing business, he actually came across ID Labs, which I had known. And we actually had looked at doing a partnership five years prior to our acquiring the company. And then what took place is that um, they were looking to sell. They had an owner by the guy by the name of Reza, excuse me, Reza Mazahari, who was looking to, um, he had a, a decision to make. Either he had to take on an investment to grow his business, or he was looking for a good conduit to sell the business to, but to continue that growth and participate in it. And it just so happens that they have products that, that are very complementary to what we currently sell. And we were looking at actually creating those products from scratch. And one thing led to another, and over the course of probably, um, this one took us probably eight months to close, which is a little long for the size of the deal we did and everything else. But um, you typically kind of go through the process of, um, first and foremost, establishing a good rapport, right, to make sure there's a good fit both culturally and things like that. And luckily, London, this is Ontario, not England, is very similar in nature in terms of the culture of Buffalo based, right? Very friendly, very good expertise in terms of what they do, trustworthy, and um, they had some, some very great products, basically, and they had a distri distribution network of over 40 different countries that they were actually selling their products to. We sell our products internationally as well, but we actually didn't have distributors lined up. We sell through the web, so that was a great way for us to get actual international distribution at the same time as getting complimentary products for our, um, our business. And so that's how we did it. I think that's great advice. You said startups, they want to think grow organically, grow organically, but if it's cheaper and faster and there's a bigger return for you to just purchase a company and you, know, you have to have the funds to do that, then that's not a waste. <laughs> there's a secret you, you paid them? In yeah, I, think, I mean, not us, but I mean, there, there's, you can be creative in terms of how you acquire companies, okay. basically, and it's not always cash up front. Okay, okay, okay. I don't know if you're like, wrote them an IOU or like a, they're Canadian, I don't know, you pay them in loonies or something, but. Um, <laughs> Serious question. If you had to have a superhero on your team, who would it be and why? Um, if I had a superhero on my team, who would it be? You know what I think? I think it would be probably um, Plastic Man. <laughs> no offense to any woman in the audience, but Plastic Man, because I think, you know, the, the, the hardest part of working in um, an innovative, creative business is, is getting people to think outside the box and getting people to realize that you have to take on different roles at different points. And Plastic Man, because of obviously the plastic nature of what he's able to do, and um, or has been able to, able to do, is a great, if you will, candidate for my business base. If I could hire a person, that would be it. Interesting. Not what I was expecting, but that, that's a good answer. What were you expecting? I don't know. Batman or... Donatello from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Closing out the 33, but uh, <laughs> they were filming Ninja Turtles. Um, so, you know, it seems like things are going pretty well for Empire Genomics. You're buying companies, you're raising money, you got customers. Take a step back. Is there ever a time where um, you were know, struggling, and you know, what what kept you going, or was everything everything was good? No, no. It, you, 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 you did talk about uh, in two thousand seven yeah. with the economic downturn. What you know, what what kept you going in those times? Yeah, I think I think the important part is there 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 are always roadblocks, potholes, and all kind of calamities that take place, basically, right? And so. Um, I think the key to, to a good startup is the leader of that company needs to be like a duck, right? And you need to be calm on the surface and working like hell beneath the water base, right? To make sure you continue to battle, basically. And so that's kind of the adage I take. And, and what keeps me going is very straightforward and simple. It's that I am so excited about what we're doing, the opportunity we have in front of us, right? And what we are indeed accomplishing, that there is, every morning I get up, I'm, I'm enthusiastic. So when that stops, that's when I think I would, I would kind of leave the business or things like that. But you have to be passionate about what you do. And it has to be more than the wealth. It has to be more than just an exciting technology. 
do something that you fundamentally believe is going to make a difference, is going to change, right? And many people don't do that. And the ones that are indeed successful, I think, have that, that kind of passion and belief that they're doing something that's going to make a difference. And that's what we're doing. So, I mean, that, that's what keeps me going. But every day there's a different obstacle. And there's some days when there's more than, than not, right? And usually it goes in, in kind of cycles. I mean, when things are up, everything starts going well. When things are down, everything starts going down, basically, right? And so you got to keep that kind of even kill, basically, keep that positive outlook. And so that's what we do. The, uh, the duck analogy took me a second. But then uh, I got it. Cue the image. <laughs> What advice would you give um, a younger individual, maybe is walking the line, entrepreneur, they got an idea, they're afraid, you know, maybe it won't work out. What advice would you give uh, somebody, I guess they don't have to be young, like yeah. anybody. I think two things. I think all too often we, we kind of get enamored as, as a population, it's not Buffalo, it's in general, with kind of the, the whole concept of the startup, right, an entrepreneur, and I think that one, it's not for everyone, right? I mean, first and foremost, it, it takes a lot to do it, and you have to be comfortable working in, a, in, a, in an environment with what I call a lot of entropy, right? There, there's no structure. I mean, each and every day you get up, the hardest part is understanding what tasks you're gonna do to keep yourself moving forward. And if you're not a self-motivated individual that can separate all the chaos from just that kind of singular focus, right? It doesn't usually work. The secondary thing, whether you're old, young, or indifferent, I think is that um, take time to understand the difference between working in a larger corporation that has some stability, but a lot of resources for you versus starting your business. And I think that um, it's not a binary event. I mean, I've worked in big businesses. I've got a lot of experience in doing so. I've built a, a tremendous professional network and it's helped me to, to be where I'm at today. And without that, I had started this business 20 years ago, right? we probably wouldn't be a success because you don't have the experience or the wherewithal to understand kind of some of the industry dynamics and understand too those relationships that I have doors that can be open because I do have that experience, right, where if you're starting from scratch, you don't per se have that. So I think the advice I give is, is kind of understand where you are, what you want to get accomplished, and what a traditional business sort of thing can help you out in doing, what an entrepreneurship can help you out in doing, and then is there a mix of the, of the two, basically. You mentioned the power of networks and connections and things that have happened because of networking and my buddy Deuce, Deuce in the back. Bigelow? Deuce. <laughs> um, we were talking about networking. How can individuals network efficiently? <laughs> it seems kind of easy. I feel like a Dalai Lama up here, I mean, what kind of questions? No, seriously. Um, um, how do, you, how do you network efficiently? I don't know, I mean, you can't, you can't really teach it. It's kind of just getting out there, base, right? It's, I, I can give you an example. Out of all the people in this audience, there's probably gonna be five people, right, that take advantage of all the people in this room, base, right, and establish an understanding of who are the people that can help them out in terms of what they're getting done. It's just really, you gotta remove the fear, you gotta put yourself out there, and put yourself in environments where you're gonna, it, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, the probability, so you have X number of balls inside of, inside of like, let's say, a, a, um, a lottery, right? And you wanna keep bouncing off those balls as much as you possibly can with the idea that you're gonna bounce and someone's gonna help you out. And that's what networking is all about. And it's all about also, too, it's networking is, you make that one contact, but then you gotta develop the relationship, right? Because it needs to get above that transactional sort of aspect of it. So, um, luckily we have some great technology to help us out. There's LinkedIn, there's our internet, I mean, it's, it's so easy now to reach pretty much anyone out there in the globe because of social media that if you don't, it's only because you choose not to. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, yeah, yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. You do a great job. I'm sure you. How do you network? I mean, come on, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I asked the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you got a question? Yeah. Hey, Anthony. Uh, you mentioned. Hey, Jake. Oh. Rich. Uh, you mentioned a couple of things uh, as traits of your employees. Uh, they, they act as owners, uh, they bring extraordinary skills to the job. So how have you focused on culture uh, when you started out? 
as you progress, what's changed? Talk about culture. Yeah, so I think, I mean, that that's crucial, right? Culture is crucial for any any stage business, and I think what we focused on is, first and foremost, recruiting what I call great people, right? So when, I, when we interview, I ask people on our team when we interview for two things. You're looking for the fit for our organization and then the expertise for the job. And if we find people that have both those fits, it's great. If we can find ones that have the best expertise but aren't a good cultural fit, we get rid of them. Be oh, go ahead. Specifically for your company, don't try to generalize. Oh, I'm telling you the truth. This is for our company. So what's a fit for our company is, again, people that are passionate. I mean, I think it's, it's one thing to work in healthcare because it's a growth industry, right? And you know that. I tell people time, people always get sick, so you always have a job. But it's something else when it means something to you personally. So for me, what, is, what does it mean what I do? Um, if I go and ask my parents right now what I do, they can't tell me, right? And if one of them were, God forbid, come out with cancer, basically, right? To me, the challenge is I want to be able to have the testing that we can offer available to them. Right, and right now that's not the case. So that's what I'm passionate about doing. I'm passionate about the fact that Norma Nowak, who founded the business, her husband died from cancer, basically, right? And she's passionate about finding a way that it doesn't happen to another family out there. So we all have our own individual stories. And the other thing I'm passionate about is growing people, right? I ask people in my organization before they get started, where do you want to be in three years, right? And if you can tell me where you want to be in three years, I know where the company needs to be in three years. I want to find a way to help you achieve that, right? And that doesn't mean you're always going to stay with our company in three years. I mean, some people say they want to run their own business. We had a guy named um, Dan Dubarian, which some people probably around here know. He started out with, as an intern with our business and grew into leading our actual marketing efforts. Now he started two different businesses, basically, right? And that's what he wanted to do when he started with us. It took him a year longer than he thought it would, but he's there, right? So for me, that's something I'm passionate about. And in our organization, that's what we're looking for. And so. Um, I'm not giving you any kind of canned, off-the-cuff remarks. I mean, these are, this is true stories here. <laughs> that was good. I'm trying to think of an easy question to ask you, so I've asked you some. How do you get the pretty woman to marry? How does that happen? <laughs> you asking me? I'm not married. I got a, I got a very lovely girlfriend, but I'm not married. All right. I thought it was be an entrepreneur, you know, you get, be an entrepreneur, make a ton of money. And that's the wrong way. <laughs> Quickest way to lose a marriage is getting an entrepreneurship. <laughs> That's a true story. Not of mine, though, not of me. Um, geez, I was going to say, like, work part. Okay, all right. To the audience. Usually we do questions to them, but I like this. Well, you guys are from Canada, so you don't have to pay, play by the rules. <laughs> okay, so I have a question when you were talking about investors. So when it comes to a very like specific industry like biotech or something that's very technical, where most private uh, investors don't have an expertise in, how do you sell them the idea of if they can't really understand the specifics? That's an easy one. You usually don't. I mean, the, the key to finding good investors and finding investment in general is you have to be able to make that investor understand what you're doing. And the easy way of doing that is that they already know your industry and have experience. If not, you find yourself answering questions that are not particular for your business, and usually you won't get that investment. So um, it's like banging your head against the wall. You need to find investors that can gravitate towards what you're doing. So they either have worked in healthcare, they have friends or family that are pretty senior in some organization, you give them some guidance, or they have, again, some sort of personal story as a reason why they want to invest. And um, without one of those three, usually you're not going to close the investment because it's just too big of a gap, a chasm to overcome, actually. And so we've, um, in, in this area, right, so if you look at kind of Western New York and upstate New York and Canada as well, basically, you're going to have a lot of those issues, right? You're not going to have a lot of biotech experience in terms of the investor base here. You'll have probably great in terms of technology, it's really great in terms of manufacturing or anything along those lines, operations, hard assets, but in terms of biotechnology, there's not a strong population here. Um, but there's some people in the audience, I mean, Jack and, and, and Jerry here, I mean, have been doing this for a while, so you, you want to comment, maybe? No? No, he says no. <laughs> he says it's a fake story, but that's a different story. <laughs> Have you looked uh, to raise money outside of Western New York, upstate New York, um, 
maybe describe that if you have it, if not. Yeah, so we're in the process of going through a capital round now, basically, and we've been we've been talking to parties in various areas, and so yeah, so pretty much our, our no, normal haunts are San Francisco, San Diego, and pretty much New York City, I would say, are the, the areas where we're looking to raise the capital, and we have investors that are um, interested, let's say, in our story, basically. And I think um, it goes kind of in the stage of the business you're in, so at the early stage, you're gonna get probably, again, a local investor base, and that's when you wanna establish that, because most investors, too, wanna to be within a fair, close proximity to the investment, which you'll hear quite often. Um, and then from there, it kind of grows as you grow the business, or as opportunities grow. So you were able, or are able to overcome that, uh, the, the distance issue. Um, is, is it a real concern to hear people, investors say, oh, I want to be close to my startups, but like, have you really encountered that, or if your story's great, you have a great opportunity, they'll overcome it? So it's a real issue. It's, it's a real issue, and, and it's an issue too in terms of um, upstate New York, right? Not, I mean, I mean, we're a, a short drive from New York City. We're well, not a short drive. But we're a drive from New York City. So I'm gonna tell you guys a story too, and this is something else that you should factor in here. Um, there are thunderstorms in the Northeast all the time, all the times in the summer. So I'm in New York City yesterday. We we're in the process of going through a capital raise. So I fly into the city at. The 545 five out, flight out base, I get to the city by like 8.30, have some great meetings. Um, I get back to the airport around six o'clock. My flight's supposed to leave at 8.10. Then at 8.10 or at six o'clock, they move it to 9.44, which moves to 11.50, which turns is canceled. So this is probably the third time, and this is dawning last night, the third time that at this time of year, I've had to drive back to New York City and to get into town at like five o'clock in the morning. So it's exactly a six and a half hour drive, if you do it right. And um, right around the area of Oswego is where you can get all your speeding tickets. And that's an important part to know. And I've done that three times as well. So don't repeat that one. Who is somebody in um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem that, that you admire and, and why? Or are they, I should say the entrepreneur, who is somebody that you admire and why? It could be, you know, uh, author or something like that. Say it again. Can't be classic. Good answer, good answer. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have kind of one person, I would say. Um, I, I admire people that are just committed to what they do. I mean, I, I think that all entrepreneurs out there, whether you're the most successful, like a Steve Jobs, or groups like guys like that. I mean, I, I love, for instance, like, um, and I'm not an iPhone user, so I'm a majority guy, this disclosure here. There it is, this, all right. Um, but w w what I like is that, um, what, what excites me about kind of entrepreneurship is, is the ability to be creative. And I think that um, if you look at someone like a Steve Jobs, what he was able to do in, different industries, right? To, to, to achieve a leadership and a, and a, um, a first and best in class for position in multiple industries, right? So Pixar with animation, he did it with Apple, he did it with, I mean, several other groups that are out there. To me, that's pretty, pretty phenomenal, right? So I admire, because I know what it takes to do it once and to do it right, I mean, at, at that level is, is amazing. And I think that um, all entrepreneurs, I mean, I have a, a great affinity for, because I think it just takes so much time and effort and you start going through and you look at what it takes to get to any modicum of success, basically, and um, many people on the outside don't understand it, but as you go through it, you start really realizing, looking back, and like, wow, it, it took us a while to get here, basically, right, and so many different steps that it's pretty impressive to me. Juice? Thank you, Steve. Yeah. So, Anthony, um, what would be your advice as far as time management in the early stages of startup? And for example, if you're one person running your business, or maybe a few, you know, you have, I guess, maybe one to five people um, that you're working with, but even on the personal level, time management, and sometimes even while you're still running your own, you know, but you still have your day job, or, or you're in the phase of going towards full-time, time management, what has been your experience, and what, what advice you can give? Well, um, there's 24 hours in a day, right? And I tend to sleep about four hours a day, so that gives me 20 hours. 
as my fellows will tell you, I'm pretty good at multitasking, right? I mean, they're in the office, I'm typing, I'm taking phone calls, which is not to be disrespectful, but I just gotta get things done, basically, right? And I think you just gotta, you have to be able to, like I said, you have to be able to set small objectives of what's the important thing you wanna get accomplished that day. And, and what you wanna do is to go in and to say in a given day, in a given week, here's what I need to accomplish. And just make sure one way or another that you get it done, right? And what happens is, you'll find that um, it allows you to start making progress. I mean, the biggest challenge I get for, for um, in terms of time management is that like, I have employees that'll say, I feel like I've accomplished nothing today. I know I have, but I feel like I've accomplished nothing. And so I say, have you looked at exactly what you want to achieve today and have you achieved it? And if the answer is no, don't leave that desk and let's get it done. But if the answer is yes, based right, then you, can, you clearly see what you've done. So it's separating kind of um, the, the, the larger project plan into a bite-sized piece that you can achieve, and then that gives you a sense of accomplishment and a way to do it. And if you have a day job and entrepreneurship is your, is your side hustle, then it's really being able to um, look at the allocation of the time from, uh, obviously there, there's friends and family, right? There's fun events you wanna do, basically, right? And you gotta be able to separate and say, well, here's where I'm gonna invest my time because I, I choose to, basically. And I think if you do that, then um, it allows you to be a success. So I'll give you like one of the things that um, I've done is, um, and up until this past year, um, I haven't owned a TV for 30 years. And I have owned a TV because it's a distraction, right? So the last year I've been distracted, but that's another story. But it helps you to focus, right? It helps you to focus. And so I choose to invest my time in the business and in these various endeavors, and that's the way you're able to achieve what you want to do. I hope that answer your question. This is my last question for you, and then we'll open it up to everybody. I ask everybody this question. World peace. How <laughs> <it's your> <laughs> Would you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Question is very simple. If Buffalo is to succeed, it needs more of what? Uncomfortable silence here. So if Buffalo is to achieve, we need succeed. succeed. I'm sorry, succeed. You know, we need. I think we need dreamers. One of the biggest issues I think we, we have as a community is we um, we don't dream big enough, and I, I think that's a challenge in terms of. I'll give you some great examples. We have a lot of. I was just talking to a person today that um, is an investor and has some successful business in the area, and he was telling me that like one of the um, U.S., I think he said this, the U.S. largest cheesecake manufacturers is located in Cheek Dewaka. We also have a group that manufactures, like for instance, the caps on a Coca-Cola bottle, right? All great businesses, all making great money, but you never hear about them basically, right? And they're not at the scale or size, right, where you think of like, like the Coke Corporation or like McDonald's or like right, anything else you can think of. And I think that's just because uh, we don't dream big enough. And when you don't dream big enough, then what happens is your accomplishments get smaller and smaller and smaller, and the risk you're taking, right, goes down as well. So if we had bigger dreamers, then we would have that much more we're accomplishing as a community. And I think that's what would enable us to be a success. Awesome. And I'd say you are definitely a big dreamer at higher genomics. It's a big dream. All right. I'm going to run the, the mic around. Are you going to run? <laughs> My question kind of revolves around big data, right? So you're developing this new software to manage all your test results. Are you, and maybe you've already done a lot of this in the early stages, right? But to recognize the trends in these genes when you get the results to tell, say, all right, we're seeing an upswing in these type of people with this gene having this problem. In your strategy is, is crunching that data and the big data analysis part of the long-term plan? Is that something you already do? Yeah, it's part of our plan. It's actually a major point of our strategic plan for, for two reasons. One is that I think that ultimately testing is, meaning the testing that we actually do is probably going to be more and more commoditized over time. And I think the real important point, and I was talking to someone today, is this, is that the, the important part is the result, right? The important part is I have this disease, I can do this therapy to treat it. That's where we're ultimately getting to. So for us, what we look at big data as, or data in general, is a way to actually create 
an index. And if we can have an index of patients that are like me or like you and have this disease, and they respond to this sort of treatment, now we have something that regardless of where that test is run, you can actually come back to us for the, to look at your results basically, right? So we're like the golden standard. So for us, data is a major part of our strategy. Um, it's something that we talk about make versus buy. We're not gonna do it in house we, or we won't create it from scratch. We'll look at, and we have looked at partnerships. We're looking at ways of um, working together with other groups to do it. And, and then you start looking at too, from a, from a business perspective, and you look at things like valuation, and healthcare IT has a much bigger valuation than does, for instance, diagnostic testing, and it's because of the margins and the scalability of it and what it could really mean. So yeah, it's a major part of our strategy and something that for us is about probably a 24 month window in terms of what's doing that implementation, but that's what we're looking to do. So your background is in the, um, in like bio and in the sciences, how did you get into business and is there a per um, particular work experience that you had that really kind of drove you to want to become a CEO and dream bigger? So I can answer the latter part first. Um, I don't think I was driven to be a CEO, right? I think I was just kind of, it, it came about in terms of where we're at right now, but it's not my, my goal or my objective, to be honest with you. Um, secondarily, I think in terms of um, the reason why I got into business is, is, is simply because of um, necessity. Um, so I was finishing my graduate research and I've been working with, I was, it, it kind of goes full circle, so I was actually working with um, chronic pain. So I was working with mice and I was basically going through and we were injecting mice with um, uh, what kind of, um, scorpion venom and puffer fish venom, right? So these are all toxins, right? And they, they kill people because they block your nerves, right? And so we were actually working with, at this time there was um, AstraZeneca and we were actually developing a new drug for them. This goes back um, early, late 90s, right? Late 90s. Now, this is actually is, is a therapy that's on the marketplace, right? So it took X number of years to make it happen, but it's actually on the marketplace. And I was looking at the research I was doing, I was looking at the cost of doing it, and it's the same time, too, when there was a boom, what's called the biotech. So pharma is chemicals and drugs, biotech is looking at, right, how your body can, in essence, kind of treat itself, for lack of a better term. And um, they were doing all this wild, crazy stuff, and they had tons of funding, basically. It was a lot like here, where they had beer every single day after work, and free food, it was just a great environment to work in. And long story short is, is that um, I knew after I finished my graduate research, I didn't want to get a PhD, and I didn't want to go to med school at that point either. And so I started interviewing for jobs, and I had the opportunities were all to like run a lab. So one was this company called Osiris down in Baltimore, and they wanted me to run their lab. It's a stem cell type company. This is again, the late 90s, and so what happened was, um, a lot of stem cells were in legal in the US, and so, you had a lot of fanatics out there that were, I went for the job interview in Baltimore, basically it was an area called Phil's Point in Baltimore, which is right around the Harbor area, but traditionally not a good area part of town. And um, they told me, you come for the interview, right? You got, this is a side story, it has nothing to do with this, but I'm just telling you the story. And so they basically said, um, you, you can't give any kind of interviews, you can't wear your badge outside of the office. And by the way, we just had a bomb threat last week, basically, right? So it's pretty serious. So long story short was, I said, ah, oh, this probably isn't the job for me, basically, right? I, I don't, I don't want to work in the lab. I have a little more personality than that. And then more importantly, again, I want to make a difference. And I think the lab is such a long process and one that is right now right for the need for innovation because we spend so much money on basic science research, which is just, I have an idea, what can I do about it, that um, it becomes very, fairly ineffective. And so I started looking at healthcare reform and what was taking place. And I interviewed for a position where the, um, the company said, listen, you're a great candidate, but for, and the job was for an international marketing position for a pharma company. And they said, you have the scientific experience, you've worked in pharmaceutical sales, so you understand some of the customers, but you've never done the business aspect, managed a P&L, right, done the marketing. And oh, by the way, have you ever traveled internationally? I was like, well, no. And so that precipitated, I said, you know what? I can understand, I said, what would make me a good candidate for this job? They said, if you probably had an MBA and about a year of international experience, you would be a great candidate, we would give you the job. So I proceeded to go get an MBA from Manchester Business School in England, basically, right? Which gave me both those things I was looking for, as well as an affinity for Man United, but that's another story. And so um, that's the reason why I'm trying to transition into business. 
And now I have, I think, what's the best of both worlds. I still work with cutting edge science. I still stay abreast of what's taking place out there, but also I'm able to understand and translate that into, again, a product or a service and what's the difference it's gonna make. Because if you just have great research, right, with nothing else, it doesn't get out there to the population. And that's what we're all about, at least I am. Does that answer your question? Thank you. All right. Question? Uh, um, question for you. Now, you mentioned uh, earlier that one of the criteria that you do ask your potential employees is where do they want to see themselves in three years? Where do you want to see yourself in 10 years as well as a company? <laughs> I didn't you know. That was I didn't know that you sure? I mean, it's, <laughs> man, this is tough questions here. So in 10 years, in 10 years, where do I want to be? Um, I want to be, I want two things for our business. I want us to be the go-to player in terms of personalized medicine globally. And what does that mean? That means that the testing that's out there, that means that when people think of personalized medicine, we come across as the number one company out there. That's the first thing I wanna have. The second thing I wanna have is, I wanna have, and it's one of my personal objectives, uh, that we are listed as a great company to work for, right, and to work with. And, and, and what that means is that we have employees that are passionate about what they do, they're excited about it, and they come to work every day because of it, as a result of it. Those are two things I want for the business. And to do that, there is financial milestones we have to meet, there is other regulatory milestones we have to meet, basically, and um, we have a game plan to do that, right? And that's what we're trying to build from a corporate perspective. Personally, um, wow, where do I want to be in 10 years? Um, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I can tell you I want to be in three to five years, but 10 years is too long. So three to five years, I think what I'm looking for, honestly, is, is to have um, a bit more work-life balance. I mean, I do an awful lot, but I was thinking about it the past couple of years, so I'm um, a bit of an adventuresome sort of person, so I like scuba diving, I like, I do marathons on occasion, distance bike rides, and like that. Over the past probably three years, I haven't had the opportunity to do a lot of that because I've been so invested in the business, basically, and so I want to get a bit more probably work-life balance over that period of time, actually. So that's what I'm going to do personally. Great. I think we have time for one more question, and then um, wrap it up. So Adam just developed uh, an app called Cork. Yes. I don't know if that's what he's going to talk about, but no, no, you should no. check it out. This is more a tech question. How do you scale up your technology? So say you, you get big and all of a sudden you get thousands of queries every second for results testing. What kind of environment are you using to scale up? Yeah, so that's one of the things I think that, that has helped us be a success is we always plan for that. So um, I can tell you that IT is a big portion of that, right, and software. So we've been looking to, and one of the jobs the fellows are working on is exactly that, right? How can we scale up? the processing of the samples as they come in, how can we sample, I mean, how can we scale up the provision of giving those results out to parties that are out there. Um, so we're always looking at that. We're always thinking kind of 18 to three years ahead in terms of where we should be um, and, and how do we get there. So a lot of what we do is actually customization. So I tell people all the time, we're all about mass customization, which you hear in the software industry, but you don't traditionally hear in the testing world. But that's what we're all set up to do. And so we've been building the standard operating procedures, the cross training, and then the software backbone that can actually substantiate and support that is what we've been doing to make sure that as we do get, if you will, those large orders in, as we keep getting more and more of those in, that we can indeed make that happen. And um, it's, it's, it's not easy to do, right? It's definitely challenging. But one of the things we do is to make sure, too, from a business development and a marketing perspective, that we're actually marketing and, and working from a standpoint of what's in the sales pipeline, so we know when we can expect roughly things to come online and make sure we actually are there to meet those those endpoints, basically. More technically, what, what environment are you developing in? Like a C sharp, a lens, a environment. Amin and Mike, I think this is a question for you two guys. What environment are we developing in? A lot of cake PHP is what we use. A lot of cake PHP, basically, right? That's what we do. And um, there's some proprietary things that are that are coded in, in different environment only because of um, both HIPAA requirements and what we do from a biological perspective, basically. But we try to um, um, 
and, and this is a public service announcement, we're always looking for great programmers, again, and great thinkers, so by all means, even if you don't see something advertised on the web, feel free to um, come and talk to us. But um, the other thing we, we, we do is um, we've leveraged sometimes a where appropriate open source, but we found a lot of issue with that in terms of just viruses and vulnerabilities and things on those lines, right? So we tend to um, develop more in-house or buy things kind of off the shelf that have protection around them for HIPAA requirements and things on those lines, basically. Well, I'll make a suggestion that that with uh, Attach and uh, Hip-Hop is native university, HBMC. Hip-Hop? I did a dance class last night in hip hop. That was great. It's really like Facebook. That's what they use and actually custom hardware as well. Okay. To manage all the traffic when they get to look at hip hop and land I definitely will. Lamp, okay. Is it that like, that's like Ruby Rails? Linux and Hatch, you might see more of these videos. Okay, perfect. There it is. Adam's a smart guy. <laughs> and he's a great brand. You see his marketing? So I thought his name was Cork. <laughs> see? <laughs> Man, see, <laughs> next name tag, Empire, right here, Empire. Oh man, I'm, I'm a little sad. This is gonna be the last time I'm up here for a little while, but if that was a great. You end on a low note, it's, a, it's only up from here, baby. It's no, only yeah, up from here. That would be great. Um, thank you to the Starter Grind team. Um, so I'm up here, I'm the, the pretty face, but there's lots of people that help me. Thank you guys. You guys are pretty too. Know what to say. <laughs> and um, we have a gift, some black scroll from Matthew Palke, uh, locally distilled. Uh, he is could, Matt in the audience? He is not, he's sick. Oh, see he's, that? Hung over, that's the train, he's hung over. <laughs> yeah. But it's battle tested, he's tasted it already. Yeah, so this is for you. Oh, I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully you guys can stick around. Uh, there's beer, there's food. Please uh, feel free. Uh, black scroll. <laughs> Shots in the yeah. back. <laughs> Thank you guys so much, man.